think about what Father Jim, Presbytera Nasha, and their family and the community were able to uh, accomplish, to create, and now to have flourish is truly remarkable, and it is truly a great blessing to witness and to celebrate. So with that, we welcome Father Jim. We ask him to come up, and let's give him and his Presbytera Nasha a round of applause. Good evening, Alicia Rakusti. I want to thank Father Chris for inviting me tonight to address you uh, this evening. Uh, it's truly an honor and a privilege to be here with you. Uh, I have visited St. Nicodius during my active ministry uh, numerous times. Uh, when I was in the youth office, I helped uh, Father T on Holy Wednesday with Ethelion, so perhaps I might have anointed some of you that are sitting here uh, this evening. Uh, my mother-in-law used to sing uh, in the choir here, Best Estafio, a blessed memory, and she loved coming to St. Victoria. She loved this parish, she loved the people here, she loved singing, and uh, this was uh, really a second home for her. I want to begin by uh, sharing uh, you a little, a little story. In, in uh, 2014, I had the privilege of attending a lecture uh, at the Holy Apostles during the celebration of books that's coming up in a week or two. Father Maximus of Simonon Petra, the monastery of Monathos, was on loan, if you could say, to uh, the states. He was teaching at our Holy Cross Seminary for a while, but he came uh, to uh, Holy Apostles that weekend to speak and as he was uh, addressing uh, the group of people that were there, among the many inspirational things that I came away with from his talk was the message of being aware and mindful of the numerous and various distractions that we have in our lives today. Father Maximus spoke of the many distractions within our lives that keep us away from focusing on what is really important in our lives, which is the ability to focus our attention and our communication with God, seeking that communication within the depths of our soul, not allowing ourselves to be distracted by secular or social influences. That paper's already stuck together. I like that. I'd like to share with you some examples of what I mean by distractions. Distractions such as television, that's probably the biggest distraction of my biggest fault since I'm a retirement. Because of some medical issues I've had uh, in, in recent years, uh, spinal stenosis and yaramata, as they, as they say, uh, televisions are everywhere. I don't know how many we have in our house, but we have more than we probably should. But they're in multiple rooms in our homes. You see them in restaurants and bars. You even see them in doctor's offices. And when I fill up the gas, the, uh, the, the car, the, the gas in my car, a TV was right over the gas pump. I mean, how much do you have to be exposed to in this stuff? Uh, it seems that they're everywhere, and every time you turn around, you're exposed to some kind of a television. Then there's the ever memorable computer. Everything from emails that we have to answer or respond to and dealing with, with their importance, the real and fake, the spam emails that we get are just nonsense emails that we have to sort out. It becomes a, quite a distraction in our lives and something that we just uh, unfortunately have to get used to. Then it's the ever memorable cell phone. You know what this is, you can't live without it, right? They call it smartphones, but I don't know why they call them smartphones. 
still you, smarter. You got one, well, no, you got one dummy that doesn't know how to use it. That's, that's, that's my problem. That's my problem. But again, we deal, with, we deal with phone calls and text messages all the time. And I saw a piece on the Today Show uh, this morning about uh, fake text messages and, and, uh, and, and uh, phone calls you get, spam phone calls you get, and they say not to answer them. Well, how do you know which ones to answer, which the ones not to answer? I'm always getting scolded by President Dad about, you shouldn't have opened that. But if I didn't open it, I wouldn't know what it was. <laughs> so where do you go with this? But again, that's just another distraction in our life and another, another pain. There are things on social media like YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. And I ask you, are all these mediums necessary? We learned, you know, 30 years ago, we learned to live without these things. We didn't have them, did we? Uh, I'd like to ask a question and, and just see a show of hands. How many of you uh, use Twitter? One, two, three. Okay, how many of you use Facebook? Well, a lot of you use Facebook, huh? Let me just ask you, does anybody really care what you're doing <laughs> when you're using Facebook? I mean, do they really care? I mean, maybe your family does, and that's 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 okay. But sometimes people put things out there just for the sake of putting things out there, and it's all cosa as they say. It's, it's just all nonsense talk. Uh, how many of you lose uh, TikTok? Are there young people here? Is that just for young people? I see younger hands showing up. Uh, how about Instagram? 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 Snapshot, Snapchat, I don't even know what Snapchat. 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 <laughs> Snapchat. <laughs> that's, that's for the you. Don't have a cell phone. I, I remember hearing a joke. Uh, it was Conan O'Brien, I think, said they're going to combine YouTube, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. Combine all those memes. They call it you, you Twitch face. <laughs> 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 but anyway, uh, these are all distractions in our life. Things that sometimes we say we can't live without, but at the same time, things that we are living with now that are distractions. Can anybody of you, if you're bold enough to respond to this question, tell me uh, why you use these platforms? Any of these platforms? Is there a positive you can come out of this, Father? I would only say, both of the church and myself, it's connectivity. It's the new level connectivity with anyone and anything. Uh, but that would be my main reason of why I use it and why I still have it. Now, I hear churches use, use uh, Facebook for certain organizations, Correct. like the young people for uh, youth groups and whatnot. And uh, I can see that. Uh, as long as it stays within that parameter, but uh, uh, I wouldn't know how to begin to FaceTime, so, or not FaceTime, but, but use Facebook and get onto that thing and whatnot. And I think one thing that I uh, have learned in my life is the, the less distractions I have in that regard, the better off, the better off I am. Because I'm afraid I can probably get in trouble. Yes. Now with connectivity, but I'm able to access a lot of books and a lot of like sources that I normally can't. Physically, like a lot of like rare books, like some of Father Sarah's Rose books that are really hard to get on Kindle. Uh huh. In creation. Did they stop printing them? Is that the? Yeah, they're like three hundred dollars per copy, but they're all over the internet. So I'm just like, yeah, I can create myself. Oh. Mm -hmm. Three hundred dollars per copy. I was in the wrong business. Yep. <laughs> 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 you wrote more books. Yeah, really, really. We're done more lectures. One or two. I don't know why. Um. But well, how about looking at uh, the family as a distraction, perhaps? Uh, obligations of being a spouse, being a parent, uh, being a child of a parent, being a grandparent, being a grandchild, being a caregiver. Uh, these obligations are somewhat of a sacred distraction, if you want to call it that, uh, within our lives. But our family is to be our priority in life. And all things that are involved with our, with uh, involved in during our daily routines, are of course distractions. 
uh, taking care of our family can be a distraction of sorts from attaining oneness with God. If we concentrate too much on one thing or one person in our family, especially if we have a child that uh, needs to be disciplined or has, uh, gets into a lot of trouble uh, from time to time, that distraction so can separate ourselves from God unless we use God as a tool to unite us with that distraction and, and try to help us uh, in a closer relationship with them. If we get upset or angry with the family member, we separate ourselves from God. And that becomes a distraction toward our oneness with God, our oneness in Christ. Just take a moment to and uh, I'll ask, ask you this question. What do you consider some of the distractions that you have in your life? Do you have any distractions? I'm sure that uh, some of you have some distractions. Anybody bold enough to raise their hand and tell us what one of their distractions might be? All of the ones you mentioned. Yeah. All of the ones, all of, all of the above. How about some new ones? <laughs> That's true. That's true. The best person that can probably attest to that would be a, man, a monk. Their warfare is all in their mind and in their soul. They don't have the distractions like we do of televisions and social media and stuff like that. But they do have the war with their mind and their soul. And that can be quite a struggle at times. As a matter of fact, I would dare say that a lot of people really don't quite understand the struggles that monastics have. Uh, in their uh, mind and soul when it comes to trying to keep from sin or trying to keep a straight and narrow path. Nowadays, uh, the use of electronic mediums such as iPads and books have all become a norm in schools. Kids uh, used to get uh, used to get bad backs from carrying their books at home because they'd have the backpack on. Be walking like a well, they would walk like I do, <laughs> and walking with with their back tilted. And this got me to thinking: our teachers back in the day, and I just think some of you might be able to relate to this. When we were growing up in school, taught us by looking at us, looking at their pupils directly. No use of a of any medium, a smart board, a computer. They just used chalk on a blackboard. No calculators. No calculators either. No, you had to use your fingers and sometimes take your shoes off and use your toes. That's why I didn't go very far in math. I could never get my shoes off. When I was, when I was a, a youngster, uh, a little tyke, it could have been fifth grade, okay, fifth grade. Could have been uh, kindergarten or first grade. One of the first things that I remember being taught about crossing the street was stop, look, and listen. You stop, look for traffic both ways, then you you look and listen for traffic or listen for someone to say it's okay to to uh, to, to cross the street. Or don't cross the street, traffic's coming. Well, I believe that we need to go back to the basics within our lives and sometimes take a step to stop, look, and listen to our Lord specifically. When I'm driving with Presidera, she doesn't sit in the back seat, but she's a good back seat driver in the front seat. <laughs> keeps telling me that I roll through stop signs and roll through my turning right on red lights and don't stop properly. I guess for the most part she's right, or maybe I should say she's always right. And I'm not saying that because she's here, but it's the truth. I've been caught twice uh, by the Big Brother cameras in turning right on a red. Uh, and she told me that I need to count to three because I make a turn on a red or a, or a stop at a stop sign and just kind of roll through it. 
Well, Father Maxwell suggests that whenever we want to need to stop to do something, we can be more fruitful in our approach toward connecting ourselves closer to God, closer to the Lord, by taking time to stop and reflect as to what we're doing at that time. And he stated it only takes three seconds. Oops, three seconds. <laughs> three seconds uh, to say the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So now when I need to stop and want to think about it, sometimes I don't. What I do, I stop and I'll say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then I'll go. And they'll do the same thing at a turn right at a stop stoplight. And to this point in time, I haven't gotten a ticket in quite a while because I've been using the Jesus prayer on that occasion. <laughs> so I need to thank both President Detta and Father Maximus for those suggestions. Now, I don't always do it, as President Detta can attest, but I try when I remember. By saying that prayer, it should not only help me save at least a hefty fine of $100 or more per occurrence, but more positive way it can help me connect myself even closely to the Lord. I've already tried it, and I feel much safer. And at the same time, I'm saving money. So maybe uh, it'll help not only save money, but save my soul, too. The next thing that we need to look at is to look. Look for ways in which we can help our fellow man by giving ourselves and giving of ourselves in a manner that Christ himself taught us. There's no better feeling in the world than helping someone out, especially those who need it. Throughout the New Testament, Christ showed us the countless examples and means of which he gave of himself and helping others unconditionally. Through the ideals of Christian stewardship, one comes to mind that through the very ideals that Christ taught us, when we talk about looking out for our fellow man in our attempts for helping out our fellow man, we can indeed give of our time helping out others, those who are in need, Spending time reading to children at school. Spending time visiting an elderly person, whether it be a relative or a friend, perhaps some of the Greek American nursing facility. Visiting the sick. Helping out with youth programs if you're at church. Uh, perhaps uh, you can help out with uh, your Junior Olympics program or rhetorical festival, or even the Fenari Camp program. We have many, many opportunities to give of our time in the church, but it's not about <coughs> having to be asked to do something. It's about you stepping forward and doing it on your own, volunteering yourself to give of your time which in turn means that you'll be giving of your talents as well. Doing things through church organizations such as philanthropists, youth groups, that ministry, parish council, the choir, uh, chanting, the beautiful chanting tonight from the chanters that you had. It was, it was very, very inspiring this evening. Uh, by taking the time and the talent to uh, make crafts, perhaps for a crafts bazaar, or doing some sewing or cleaning, or baking, or cooking, making koliva, making prosporo, decorating icons. There's so many things that so many of you have uh, God-given talent to do. Uh, doing these things is, again, giving of our time and giving ourselves an opportunity to look in a positive way towards uniting ourselves with Christ through our actions, through our works. And then, of course, we give of our treasures, making donations to various causes, helping out to organize and run fundraising events, and helping develop creative ideas for fundraising. 
I'm sure that you have no problem raising monies in this church, right? Sure. Yeah, sure. You know, it's always it's always nice for someone to come up and say to you, Father, I've got an idea for a fundraiser. Now, other than short of a casino night or something like that, uh, we usually listen. Uh, and sometimes people come up with some very, very good suggestions. So try to be creative in that thought and, and help the church, again, not by being wait, waiting, waiting to be asked, but to ask and volunteer yourself for that particular cause. People in general need to become more proactive and look to offer their help and assistance for the benefit of others, and in turn it comes to benefit you too, but also your church, and most especially those in need, and simply not wait to be asked. The ability to physically look around your surroundings is also imperative, especially when we are in church. You have a beautiful church building here, and inside your church, your nave, and your altar are flooded with iconography. And I don't mean for you to just look at these icons uh, and look at the holy altar and seeking inspiration and connection to Christ and, and God. Those icons on the walls are not there just for decoration. They're there for a reason. They're there to communicate with us and to pray to you and for you to pray to those icons to receive their inspiration and to lead you to becoming closer to Christ so you can achieve the grace that leads toward our salvation. I remember in my days at seminary, and Father Chris can attest to that because he and I were schoolmates uh, a couple years apart. There was a beautiful icon on the Iconostasium at the chapel of the Panagia. <coughs> For some reason, that icon always spoke to me. Uh, I usually sat on the facing the altar, sat on the left-hand side of the, of the of the chapel, of the second or third row, and I would just gaze upon the face of that icon. And at times, I was mesmerized by it, and it led me to inspiration to grow closer to an appreciation of the Panagia of what she stood for, who she was, and how she accepted the call to bear Christ, to bear God. And that's, that's something that almost for many of us would be incomprehensible. Can you imagine God coming to you and asking you to do something as great as that? The first thing that would come to mind is, I'm not worthy. She wasn't either. She didn't feel worthy. But she accepted that invitation. She accepted that calling. One that really changed the lives of all of us throughout the history of man. We look at these icons to inspire us so that we can achieve the grace that leads us toward our salvation. But among the things that we need to be most sensitive to is perhaps, and most important of these three things that we talk about, we talk about stop, look, and listen, is to listen to our Lord. That's to listen to what he has to say to us. We get so distracted in our lives with all of the technology that is in front of us that we simply don't take the time to listen Listen to what the Lord is saying to us. You've heard the expression that silence is golden. Your parents used to tell us all the, all the time, and that was a nice way of just telling us to shut up. <laughs> but sometimes we need silence around us so that we can listen more closely to what the Lord is trying to tell us. We all too often do not take the time to simply listen to what the Lord has to say to us. We're too busy, too distracted, watching television, listening to our 
radios or downloads of music, fooling around on the internet, or playing games. We get so distracted with the superficial things in life that we do not take the time to listen to the Lord as he attempts to reach out to us within the depths of what is very, very important, the depths of our very soul. When I've spoken to groups in the past, I like to use this exercise. I want you to all close your eyes for just a moment, and we're going to be silent. Well, close to a minute. And see if some way you can hear the Lord speaking to you through this quiet and silent prayer. So let's close our eyes for a moment. Bow your heads if you would. And just let's remain silent for a minute. Amen. That seemed like an eternity, didn't it? It seemed like a long time. It wasn't more than 30, 35 seconds. Can you imagine how much you could get done in a minute by being quiet and silent and trying to listen to the Lord? I think the Lord spoke to me while I had my eyes closed. He said, let's wrap this up. Pretty <laughs> During my active ministry, I taught prospective catechists the very first session of the numerous classes of catechism that I offered, catechism instruction that I offered, that they would receive prior to their chrismation or even baptism in the church. You know, I'm talking about adults now. I would give an introductory segment. The first segment that we had was called the Tour of the Church. The first thing that I taught them was when we entered into the narthex, I would pick up a candle and show them how we light the candle and place it into the sandbox as we prepare ourselves to enter the church. I explained to them the reason we light a candle is that we are now leaving the outside world behind us and kind of turning on a light switch when we light that candle turning on the light switch of our soul. By placing that candle in the receptacle, we are establishing that this is going to be our prayer offering for this day's, this evening's worship, or this day's worship. With the lighting of that taper and placing it in the sandbox, we are beginning to actively remind ourselves that we are no longer concerned about the things that are going outside of the church. Now we're going to focus our attention on what's going on inside the church. Preparing ourselves for prayer so that we should no longer be distracted and simply listen to what God has to say for us, to us. For he will always have a special message for each and every one of us during any particular time that we enter the church. We never know when he's going to speak to us. But he will, if we are attentive, and if we are paying attention and listening to what he has to say. Many times you hear uh, during a church service, Proskman, let us be attentive. You usually hear that before we hear a gospel lesson or an epistle lesson. And that was done for a particular reason. Uh, and this kind of started in monasteries again, where 
monks who would be standing for hours upon hours at the time of worship and prayer would have a tendency to fall asleep. And it's not only monks, but seminarians too, if I recall correctly. Um, I, was, I was at a Lenten service at, at school one year. I was sitting in the back. It was a church service that I didn't want to go to, the can of St. Andrew. Uh, God forgive me for saying this, but it's a very boring service. So I figured I'd bring a book along with me to read. And as I was sitting in the back of the, of the, uh, of the chapel, I had this book. It's called The Art of Prayer. And I sat down, I placed the book across my chest, and I nodded off, <laughs> fell asleep, with the book, The Art of Prayer, across my chest. <laughs> well, the now Metropolitan Isaiah, who was Father Isaiah at the time, one of whose our dean of students, walked in and watched me sleeping with the art of prayer across my chest. Needless to say, he kicked me and woke me up. And he used to wear these big, heavy boots. He still does. And uh, kind of jostled me for a minute. But then he laughed. <laughs> I wasn't laughing at that. I was very embarrassed. But that's what happens when you get distracted and don't pay attention, don't listen to what you should be doing while you're in church. I often got distracted uh, in chapel services as well. I remember another time that I was in, uh, in chapel. It was in the morning, and I was kind of feeling listless and silly and everything else. And, I was standing during the service, the matinee service in the morning, and I wasn't paying much attention to what was going on. And a uh, senior schoolmate of mine, uh, an upperclassman, uh, kind of saw that I was not focusing on the church service at the time, that I was distracted and not praying. After the service, I was exiting my pew and leaving the chapel to go to breakfast, the separate classman, Father Michael Reimer, blessed memory, stopped me and said, I saw that you were distracted this morning. Why don't we both go back into the chapel and pray together for a while? As embarrassed as I was, I did. And he went back with me. I never left the church service again without taking the time to pray. Now you may say that's kind of silly for a priest to say that, but we get distracted in the altar too. We get distracted with the rubrics, the altar boys, the things that we have to do in order to do things properly. The other priests. The other priests. <laughs> I, left you, I left you wide open for that one, didn't I? All those distractions are not, are not good distractions. They're not healthy distractions. Uh, what's, what was nice about what Father Michael did is he did not chastise me. He didn't scold me. He didn't make fun of me. <laughs> he just simply asked if I wanted to go back into the chapel and pray with him. That had a tremendous impact on me. I never, ever forgot it. So with all these things being said, we need to really take a time in our church today that has been given to us by God during this holy season of Great Lent to stop, to look, and to listen. To whom? To our Lord. To give ourselves the opportunity to grow closer to Christ at the same time, better ourselves and allow our souls to grow for our spiritual lives so that we can mature in our life in Christ. With these words, I wish you Kalisa and Christina. Have a blessed day. Um, before we uh, obviously thank Father Jim for his beautiful words, does everyone have any questions or any 
any comments or just a few things that they maybe want to express to Father Jim? Um, or anything? Um, no? Uh, thank you, Father Jim. Those really are called the beautiful. We thank you for your uh, beautiful uh, words of love. God bless you. Kalibina me, Kalisana Pussy, for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Again, we want to give a big thank you to our Philokoma Society for this beautiful meal. Sukari Vidya, thank you, Yaola, Kalisana Pussy. God willing, we'll see all of you Friday for the second stanza of the salutation, Sukari Vidmos, beginning at 645. And we pray all of you have a blessed and beautiful evening. I just want to say one more thing, if I can, before we go. You have a wonderful priest. Oh, yes. That one's like, and all I can say, because I've been around, I serve numerous parishes and uh, the metropolis as well as his uh, youth director, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Treat him well. Because he's a gem. Every day. Every day. Absolutely. I don't I don't say this big He's a year older this way. Well, it's, it's, it's a fact. It's a fact that uh, we have uh, a lot of good priests out there, but then we have exceptional priests, and Father Chris Chris goes into that category. Exceptional. <laughs> this is a paid advertisement. This is a paid advertisement. <laughs>